Hello and welcome back. In this video we're going to take a look at adding JWT bearer authentication to a hot chocolate GraphQL API. You'll notice I have a solution created ready for this video with an API project and an identity server project. In the identity server project, I have the quick start a UI that integrates with SP.NET Core Identity. And I've also got the project set up to use entity framework migrations in order to store identity related data in a database. The API is our GraphQL API using the hot chocolate GraphQL framework. In the program startup, you can see it's very minimal, simply adding GraphQL server with our query query type and then map GraphQL in the middleware. And our query class simply contains a single query for uh, getting a book. And that book has a title and an author with the author having a name. If I show all the files in the solution, you'll notice that I have a local host self site certificates generated ready. And I also have this Docker compose file. Now this Docker Compose file contains three services. It contains one for the GraphQL API, one for the Postgres database, and one for the identity server application. You'll notice the identity server application has our database connection strings. And you'll notice our API has environment variables for the authority and the audience. Now the authority is essentially the URL of the identity server. So this is HTTPS colon slash slash identity server colon port 7000. And the audience is essentially the name that we have given to the API resource in identity server. In this case, it's this uh, unique identifier. And this audience matches the audience uh, name for the API resource in the identity server seed data. You can see here the name of the API resource, its unique identifier. This name matches the audience environment variable for the API service in our Docker Compose file. So that's a brief overview of this solution. And now what I'm going to do is run Docker Compose up in order to build the solution. That's the GraphQL API, the identity server, and also our Postgres database. When you're running this for the first time, it will take a little while longer than usual as it pulls down the base images for things like Postgres and ASP.NET Core. So we give it a few seconds, and as you can see there, we now have all of our uh, services running inside Docker Compose. If we expand the services, you can see we have our API, our database, and our identity server. If I pop over here onto the right-hand side, you'll see I've added a connection to that Postgres database running inside the Docker container. So we have an identity database and an identity server database. In the identity database, we have a user. We also have an administrator role and we also then have a join between the user and the role in the user roles table. If we come down to the identity server database, you'll notice that we have our API resource for our GraphQL API. We also have an API scope for that API. And we also have a client for banana cake pop and we use this client in order to test out the API in the browser using banana cake pop. So that's a brief look at the Postgres databases that we have. Again, one for identity and one for identity server. Now if we open up the browser and if we go to HTTPS colon slash slash API port 7001 slash GraphQL, this will rely on you having the appropriate entry in your host file for API in order to point that to localhost. If we go to that URL, you can see here that we have our GraphQL 
uh, Banana Cake Pop uh, browser. And what we're going to do is we are going to run that uh, book query in order to test that our GraphQL API works as intended. So what we do is we will create a query for book and we return the title and we'll also return the name of the author. If we run that query, you can see there we have the data over on the right hand side, just hard coded for the purposes of this video. You can see the book's title and the name of the author there in the response back from the GraphQL API. So what we are going to do now is add JWT bearer authentication into that GraphQL API. So first things first, if we right click on the API project, click on manage NuGet packages, you can see we've already got the ASP.NET Core hot chocolate package installed. However, we are going to want a couple of additional packages. The first of which is the hot chocolate ASP.NET Core authorization package. So we're going to install that into the project. And then we're also going to want the JWT bearer authentication package from Microsoft. So we'll install that package into the API like so. You should now have the hot chocolate ASP.NET Core package, hot chocolate ASP.NET Core authorization, and also Microsoft ASP.NET Core authentication JWT bearer. You should have those three packages referenced from the API project. Now what we're going to do is we're going to open up the program c -sharp file and we're going to add our JWT bearer authentication. So just above our builder.services.add GraphQL server, we're going to write builder.services.add authentication, JWT bearer defaults.authentication scheme, and then we're going to say dot add JWT bearer. This is going to provide us with an options action and I'll rename the options to JWT bearer options to make it clear these are our JWT bearer options that we are configuring. And what we're going to do is say JWT bearer options dot authority equals builder dot configuration. And then we're going to say authentication code form authority. And we're going to do the same thing again, JWT bearer options dot audience this time. The exact same thing again, but for the audience. And this is going to be builder dot configuration. And then we're going to say authentication colon audience. And these uh, configuration values are picked up from the environment variables that we defined in the Docker compose file. You'll notice in our API service, we have an environment variable for the authentication authority, which points to our identity server. That matches the builder.configuration authentication authority. And we also have authentication audience. And that matches with the builder.configuration authentication audience. You'll notice in the Docker Compose file, the environment variables are separated with two underscores. Whereas when we reference them from our c -sharp source code, they are separated by a colon. An important distinction there between the environment variables and how you reference them from within the code. So next up, what we are going to do is set our token validation parameters. So we're going to say JWT bearer options dot token validation parameters dot validate audience equals true because we want it to validate the audience that we have defined above. We then do the same thing again, token validation parameters dot validate issuer, because again, we want it to make sure these tokens are issued by our identity server and our identity server only. And then we're going to do the same thing again with validate issuer signing key. And that will make sure that the JWT has been signed by our identity server and not some other uh, malicious issuer. That means essentially that we will only accept JWTs that have been signed by our identity server. 
So that is the JWT bearer authentication added to the services. What we're going to do now is come down to our middleware and then between app.useRouting and app.mapGraphQL, we're going to say app.useAuthentication. And then last but not least, we can modify our call to add GraphQL server. And what we're going to do after that is say add authorization. And that will essentially integrate uh, the hot chocolate framework with the authentication in the ASP.NET Core framework. So what we are going to do now is go into our query class and we are going to add a new query. So we've already got the get book query and what we are going to do is we are going to create a, another query that returns a string and this is going to be called a get me and this is going to take in a nullable claims principle as an argument into that method and then what we're going to do is say return user dot find first value and then claim types dot name identifier and essentially what this is going to do is it's going to check to see if the user is uh, authenticated and if so it's going to return their identifier so their user id that's synonymous with the subclaim in the JWT. So if they're authenticated, that will return their user ID. And if they're not authenticated, it will simply return null. So what we are going to do now is we are going to rerun uh, the docker compose up command, making sure we pass in uh, dash dash build in order to rebuild the uh, containers given that we've made changes to the applications. This will take a few seconds to rebuild uh, those three containers for us and as we can see there it's just finishing off spinning up those containers. They're now running all three of them and you can see we have again our API, our database and our identity server. So if I come back into the browser if I now reload the schema, we can see here the schema has been updated. What I'm going to do is just execute this operation again, make sure that we get our book back successfully, which we have. And if I now remove book, you can see we have our me query. What I'm going to do is run that query and you can see by default me is null because we haven't authenticated. That means that the uh, claims principle that's injected into this get me query is null because there is no current user. So what we're going to do back in uh, banana cake pop, we're going to click on the connection settings. We're going to come over to the authorization tab, change the authorization type to OAuth2. You can see we have our grant type of authorization code the authorization URL is going to be HTTPS identity server port 7000 slash connect slash authorize. And the access token URL is the same again, but ending in token instead of authorize. And if we now browse to our database and we're going to take a look at the client ID for our banana cake pop client. You'll notice here the client ID is a unique identifier. So we'll paste that in the client ID. The client secret we set up to just be secret. Again, feel free to use any other secret that you like for the client, making sure of course that it is secure, especially in a production environment. Now the redirect URI, this is going to be the URI of the GraphQL server. So that's HTTPS colon slash slash API port 7001 slash GraphQL. And we can verify that if we go into the client redirect your rise table, you'll see that our banana cake pop client has a redirect URI for the GraphQL URL. If we pop back into banana cake pop itself, we can then fill in these scopes. That's going to be OpenID profile 
email role and https colon slash slash www.example.com slash API. Those are the scopes that we have set up for the banana cake pop client. Feel free to add or remove any other scopes that are necessary for your particular requirements. And what we can then do is come down to the bottom and we can click on fetch token. You'll see here we are then presented with the identity server uh, login UI. Now I've set up a user, thomas.clark, with a password of PA55W0RD, exclamation mark. Again, you may have a different user set up in your uh, user store. That's what I've just set up for the purposes of this sample. If I then hit login, you can see we are redirected back to Banana Cake Pop. And you can see here, it's just finalizing the ID token and access token. And you can see there we have our ID token and our access token from identity server. So what we then do is we will hit apply like so. And if we now rerun that operation, you can see now that me has returned the user ID of the currently authenticated user. Thomas.clark in this case, that's the user that we signed into identity server with. And we can validate that if we come into the identity database. And if we open up the ASP.NET users table, you can see that the user with username Thomas.clark has the same user ID here as what we get returned back from our me query in GraphQL. So that essentially shows you how you can add JWT bearer authentication into the GraphQL API. Now it's important to note that we haven't covered authorization in this video, which means that these endpoints are still uh, publicly accessible by any user. And we just happen to get the user's uh, user ID if they are authenticated. So as I say, this just covers the JWT bearer authentication part of the API, and this does not cover the authorization part, which is about making sure the user has the appropriate access to be able to um, call that query in the API. So I hope you found this video useful, and thank you very much for watching.